But I do think in terms of relationship and safety, that hierarchy is fundamentally problematic and that it needs to be examined and disrupted. We're in search of new rules for work, evidence-based practices fit for a hybrid world. This year, we're hosting a multi-month interdisciplinary research project looking for the best ways of unleashing team creativity. Join me, David Mastronardi, and my new Rules for Work co-producer, Elise Keith, as we explore the minds and the work of the people shaping not just our project, but the new Rules for Work. This project is made possible through the generous contributions of many people who are volunteering their time and through the support of our partners. To learn more about the project, buy tickets for January Symposium, register your team for the experiment, or partner with us, check out newrulesforwork.com. If you want to get in touch directly, email info at newrulesforwork.com. Today, we are talking to Sun Brown, who's the best-selling author, keynote speaker, season facilitator, and American Zen chaplain in training. She's the founder of the creative consultancy Sun Brown Inc. And most recently, she founded the Center for Deep Self Design in Austin, Texas. Sun was named one of the 100 most creative people in business and one of the 10 most creative people on Twitter back in the day, right? Not, not today's Twitter, but maybe Twitter <laughs> like, yeah, you know, a couple months ago <laughs> by, by Fast Company. Yeah. Um, and she's got this great TED talk that's been seen over 1.6 million times. And her work on visual facilitation has been featured in like everything, like the Times and the Post and, and books and all kinds of stuff. Now, as a facilitator, Sun and her team have designed and led hundreds of group experiences in diverse industries. And her two books, Game Storming, a playbook for innovators, rule makers, no, 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 rule breakers and change makers <laughs> as the doodle revolution um, have been translated into 27 languages and counting. Mm. So today, in addition to acting as an advisor for us on the new rules for work program, Sun's also working with O'Reilly on Game Storming 2, as well as a book on collaboration literacy where they look at designing systems of relational intelligence for group experiences. Mm. So I'm fascinated to hear what relational intelligence means and what drove you to this program. Thank you so much for joining us, son. Oh yeah, I'm so happy to be here and I'm so excited to be an advisor on your project and your experiment, which is I think impressive. Uh, at least I could never create and design something like this. It's not my strength. So I'm really glad to participate and to see what happens you know, and to be in the cohort group of people that are working on it. So way to provoke the whole thing, Dave. Nice work on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> where so where are you coming to us from today? Well, right now I'm in Asheville, yeah. but you know what? I'm considering moving to Peru. Oh. <laughs> I know. I'm just putting that in there for fun context, texture. And Same stuff. time zone. Yeah, that's the whole point. Easy. It's like what no one will even know. Like I could be there right now. Y'all wouldn't know it's a remote work world. Same so part zone. of me is like, I don't even need to tell people because how will they know? They won't. <laughs> <laughs> better, better ceviche. Um, <laughs> so I'm interested in the same thing that Elise mentioned, uh, yeah. hearing more about collaboration literacy. Yes. Yes. What, oh, we're like, what, yeah. What is, what is that? What, how has that come to be? So that is a, a big question and a good question. And actually, I was working on this today. I think we've all been interested in collaboration for most of our careers, all, all three of us. But I started getting really much more focused on what that literacy is and actually what's missing from cultures and teams when they struggle to collaborate, which we've all also witnessed, um, particularly when the everything kind of fell apart in the in, during the pandemic, which is still ongoing. Um, so I got much, much more interested in what is the texture, what is the almost the ineffable qualities that make collaboration more plausible, feasible, doable, um, emergent. And so for me, a collaboration literacy, and I'm still working on the book, right? So I'm still, um, you really learn about something when you write a book about it. That's like the beauty of that, that exchange. But for me, it's about how does one become skillful in collaboration, um, not not because it's the only place to land, but because you want to be able to do it when it's needed. 
witnessing a big, big company was a, a real uh, journey and a real education around when does it break down? How can you support it and what's needed? So yeah, literacy for me means ultimately skillfulness um, and the variety of ways you can approach it. So I have to I have to dig into something you said there because um, you used a couple of words that I've also heard business leaders use. Oh God, that's a jargon. Um, up. <laughs> I, well, it's not so much the jargoning <laughs> thing. It's just it. You know, I'm both peaked and tweaked about this idea of collaboration being something that has learnable skills. Right? Mm -hmm. You get literacy sort of assumes that there mm -hmm. is a path of learnability and mastery. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you pair that with the ineffability mm -hmm. yeah. of the emergent properties. Like how do you um yeah, how do you reconcile yeah. uh the idea of uh literacy and the ineffable? Yeah, I love it. That's wonderful, Elise. So uh I don't know that mastery is available to all people. Uh and I think because I think people have different strengths and different skill sets. So when I, I think maybe, I don't mean fluency, I just mean literacy. So, and for me, those are different things and there's different degrees of fluency. So it's a wonderful inquiry because, so I'll take it back to my early days as a visual thinking educator, which I still am, but it's not my primary focus anymore. I had these delusions that any and all students could readily integrate this visual language into their you know, toolkit. And that's not false, but my my perception of where they could land and how skillful they could become and, and how passionate they would even be was sort of distorted. And I think that's true for collaboration literacy too. I think that not everybody needs to know it, not and you know, inside of a system, inside of an organization, and not everybody's gonna have a natural capacity for it or an orientation, like a psychological orientation for it. Um, and so there's that just sort of comment. And then the piece about the ineffability. So that actually, at least, is my where where I'm most fascinated because there is a mystery. You can architect structure, and we should, and that's what our experiment is about, right? Is 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 what what can you do to like really make a liquid uh, process that has this emergent quality? But there's this other piece, and we can totally get into that because my point of view is that that piece can be engineered to a certain extent and then there's something fucking magical that happens <laughs> and it's just not it's not you can't even predict it or or control it you know it's like a thing that occurs between human beings and that's the relational piece that i'm fascinated by and i do think that can also be supported but again it's not a predictable controllable outcome. It's a, it's an intention, it's an orientation an aspiration and a way of being together that isn't, um, um, it has some mystery, you know? So would it be fair to say that, um, that you believe in creating the context or setting up the circumstances where magic is possible? Yes. But not necessarily the predictability of magical That's right. and, and, and exactly. results. Yes. It's beautifully summarized. And I also think that's where the comfort with improvisation and not knowing comes in, in a process, because, you know, all of us are trained and to a certain extent in wanting to know what's going to happen and being uncomfortable, like, especially if you're the facilitator, your job is to create some kind of outcome that's viable, useful, desirable, et cetera. So there, there is a level of courage that's required when you actually know and you allow for the fact that you can't know, you know, <laughs> and I think that's mastery. Like if we want to talk about mastery for me, that's a place where, uh, you, you really don't blame yourself. You don't blame the process. You don't blame other people. You don't, um, lament. You just know that that's the nature of the experience. It can be the nature of the experience. And to your point, yeah, you set it up for success as absolutely best you can, knowing that some of it, you got it. What's the expression? Like it goes to God. You know, like it just goes. And so those are both true, you know? And I I don't think that's why maybe we all love this work. I'm not sure. I know there's lots of reasons, but probably that's one of them. To make sense of some of the things that you were talking about, um, these learnable skills in a mastery, not available for everybody. But mm -hmm. then we also talked about literacy and fluency. 
Yeah. And just, is there a spectrum? Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to guess it's, um, literacy, fluency, mastery. Sure. Let's but, go with that. I mean, uh, yeah. what, what in your mind kind of, se- <laughs> is there something that separates the, so I, yeah, yeah, I'm just making this up. This is a great question, Dave. I'm just making this up on the spot. Um, if I were to designate a distinction between literacy and fluency, and I really am just making this up. No one's ever asked me that. Um, cause again, I'm still researching all this stuff. Um, in, in this context, um, I would say that people that are literate are people that can design a meaningful meeting. So they're like, they have the tools. So the seven P's just take the seven P's process, product, people, pitfalls, blah, blah, blah. So there's a functionality and a skill set that would make an experience gathering people together more fruitful, you know, purposeful, intentional, viable. And that is literacy. And that's awesome. And so I would say that fluency is that some of that comes naturally. So you don't have, I used to architect the shit out of stuff when I was an early facilitator, because I was so afraid that I would mess it up and that I wouldn't look smart and that they wouldn't trust me anymore. You know, like you have all those fears. And I think fluency is more about improvisational jazz in a way. And I think that there is a trust that happens and there is also a, a personal, um, presencing that is available that makes some of that magic available to others because you're holding the space in a way that doesn't um, necessitate perfection or uh, flawlessness. And so those are the places where I think fluency and mastery become available, but I wouldn't know how to stack it. You know, I don't like the word mastery because it's it's gender biased word. I'm always looking for because master is a, is a masculine term. So I'm always like, what's the woman version of mastery? Is it Madame Marie? You know, <laughs> is it femory? I don't know, okay. but I, I really use the term, but I know what you're asking. Okay. Is that, is that helpful? Yeah, it is. And I wanted, I did want to ask, but I hear you, you're saying mastery and fluency interchangeably. But the reason I picked up on that is because improv, I feel like improv is yeah. the, is at the pinnacle. Like when you're, when you're really doing it well, and this is anything, yeah, right. This is anything. Yeah. It's, it's not forced. You don't exactly. have to think yeah, about it's like, it. It's it, it in just your comes body. to you. Okay. Yeah. But you're so, a guitar player. So, you know, you can relate to that in that way. I am not, I am not a master. <laughs> I'm not fluent you're literate. in guitar. You're literate. It's, I, yeah. I stick to the cover <laughs> stuff, the stuff that's already been done. I just mimic it, which I feel like is at the lowest, but that's how I learned game storming. And, and yeah. I think that's how most people learn things is, totally. oh, I like that. I, we, we did something that created this outcome or I like the experience. I want to learn how to do that. I'm going to copy what that person did to get us there. Yeah. And I think that's, that's your first step into the world. Of, totally. And that's why when Keith was emphasizing communities of practice, that's key. It's crucial. Yeah. I mean, you've got to have people that help hold your hand, walk with you, lean on you, you lean on them and you do stuff that you don't, you're not familiar with. I mean, those are, that's absolutely essential and you can't start at the pinnacle, so to speak. Um, you know, it's a journey. I think that's one of the things that's super interesting about our experiment, right? Mm-hmm. Because um, on the one hand, we're, we're tackling this really uh, complex, potentially masterful environment of creative problem solving with complex challenges mm-hmm. um, and in such a way that it should be accessible to anybody to lead it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That um, part is so interesting. There's something about learning how to do meetings, period, that's very much bicycle riding. Totally. Right? It's very much must yeah. be in the body, must be done. Mm-hmm. Which is one of the reasons so many meeting trainings just bomb. But because they didn't learn how to ride the bike yet. Mm-hmm. They, well, are, they, they don't even they, know there is a bike. <laughs> they tell you what to do, which is not the same thing as right. uh, experiencing having it done and yeah. then getting a chance to reflect that back out again. Yeah. See, that's so cool because in terms of the experiment, because um it it, it feels like an unsolvable, it, it's such a mysterious thing because it has, it's sort of similar, just follow my thinking on this and see if it makes sense. It's sort of similar to like, say you have this beautiful thing and it's gold and you want to scale the gold. And then every time you do that, you have to alchemize it so that it's scalable. And then it turns into like metals and like mixed sort of other elements. And it's not gold anymore. 
So it's like that. I have not. I, I have personally not solved this problem in a, in a way that uh, satisfies me. But it's like you were saying. It's like there. Your experiment or our. I don't know if it's yours or ours. It's the world's. Um, it's all of ours. Is is designed to ha make the best of both, right? Like you're you're looking for the gold, but you're also looking for a way to take that gold to as many people as possible, and and maintain some of the shiny. Right. And, and also make it to where it's not required to have an expert facilitator or a master facilitator or a femme facilitator. <laughs> we need another word. <laughs> right. right. So that is beautiful because we'll see, like, I don't have any doubt. We're going to probably be wowed by submissions. Um, I think there's no doubt. And I'm, I'm so excited about that part. And then the inquiry is around for me is around how is it wielded in the hands of others who may come cold to leading a process? Mm -hmm. It's cool. Did y'all hear so, that, y'all? Submissions, bring them on. It, it will be fascinating. Yes. Uh, totally. Through this lens of collaboration literacy mm -hmm. and this change that's happened, mm -hmm. how, how, how did you perceive it? What was, what was, and maybe you can only say this now as this collabor collaboration literacy is something you are you know struggling with in a healthy way to define and figure out yeah. what was before what was collaboration literacy before before pre-pandemic pre what what's the transition how how have you witnessed it and why do you think this this concept of collaboration literacy has come to you in the way that it has yeah see that's interesting because I know that so much of people's sort of frustration or um, feeling of of maybe even paralysis around process has to do with the tech, the intervention of technology. So when we were physically together, you could have moments of of collaboration that were simple and human. Like if you were, say, you were walking together to get muffins, and then you both run into the muffin table at the same time. So you're like, oh, let's carry the muffins to other people. So it's a very natural kind of organic thing. So I think people think that that's utterly lost. And I don't share that perspective. I think you can do a ton on uh, in this medium. And I think that people haven't really tested the boundaries of what you can do because I think they're more uh, fearful of looking foolish, which is classic human stuff. I'm, I have those same concerns. Um, but I think that you can actually generate uh, relational spaces um, that are warm, that are co co congenial, collegial, both, um, and that, that have a connective quality, that have connective tissue. I, I think you can absolutely do that in this medium that feels cold and can feel disconnected. And so for me, the literacy, the change from literacy prior and literacy now isn't that dramatic. It's like, yes, you have to have methods and you have to adapt them to environments and stuff. But I think humans can connect across a whole host of mediums and you have to set them up for that. And sometimes you do need a person to model and demo and encourage, right? And um, offer permission and so forth. But you can do that online. You don't have to be together. And I, I do think people are seriously underestimating that that is still available to us. And I think they need to test stuff more. And I do, and it, it does make me wonder about the significance of the facilitative person. Um, you know, like just like the rest of y'all, I want it to be very DIY and available to people. But man, you know, we've all been in experiences <laughs> where it's like, oh man, if only they had a facilitative capacity or a facilitator, it would just maybe be a game changer. So it's, that's also a question, you know? You were innovator in residence in mural. Mm -hmm. you, you saw a lot there mm -hmm. with them. You saw a lot with clients, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Who was, who was getting it right or not who, yeah. what behaviors uh, were, were getting it right? Yeah. Where did you see some positives and some good, uh, like maybe natural responses without having a, a, a deep bookshelf of, right, right. or playbooks of what to do yeah. now? I'm sure some people did the right things, maybe mm -hmm. un, unwittingly. 
Yeah. <laughs> Accidentally. Yeah. Was that a nod to Keith? Um, <laughs> so, uh, well, I think that has, that has, there's a baseline cultural dynamic that makes things possible. And so I know that psych safety is a big buzzword and all this stuff, but um, the truth for me is that when you have a foundation of care and uh, respect and um, a sort of like like less hierarchical structure and a healthy culture, a lot more is possible. And so to me, it's really it, the, the way that people interact is actually um, rev revelatory of the foundational culture. And so when you ask who's getting it right, it's the people who actually focus on those relationships and their culture. And is it safe to say these things? And what happens when you do something wrong? And how do you recover when something breaks down? Like that, that people that are focusing on the prioritization of the healthy dynamics between human beings are the people who are going to get it right, even if they have no clue about these techniques or these methods or whatever, because it's safe to try. It's safe to jump. It's safe to experiment. It's safe to learn together. Right. And I wish there was more of those. I mean, it's not common. It really is not that common, um, depending on the size of the business and stuff like that. Any insights into why it's not that common across all of the the clients that you were maybe working with or witnessing or even hearing yeah. stories about? Any any hypotheses around a, a common thread or something that is keeping people from making that proper prioritization? I think there's two things. One is uh, capital capitalist corporate systems is are fundamentally flawed uh, in terms of relationship, and two is psychology. So human psychology. We're all protecting ourselves from each other, understandably. So we have these um, uh, this scaffolding. Uh, we don't want to be vulnerable, so we have psychological scaffolding that prevents us from being vulnerable, understandably. So there's the human condition piece, and then there's a corporate system piece. Um, and I think they're both honest. Honestly, I think they're both uh, sort of tidal waves of, against some of the things that I know that we would all be happier if they were around including collaboration. And so I think sometimes when people are successful, when there are cultures that are healthy and there are um, um, systems that support collaboration, I think they should be really celebrated because I don't think that they're the norm. I think they're typically anomalies. I don't think that's insightful, particularly insightful. I just think that that needs to be t talked about openly. You know, I think hierarchy fundamentally is corrosive um, for relationship. And corporate systems are hierarchical by definition. And so I don't know how much they can accommodate in terms of deep, deep well-being, which is where my interest is, you know. And sometimes you can create these places and spaces and teams and so forth. But I think ultimately the complexity of those systems is in the way, you know. It's experimentation. Mm -hmm. I know some people you're going to have to interact with at the symposium yeah. for sure, um, awesome. who are, who are looking at, um, conscious capitalism. So basically other ways to organize yeah. businesses that are different from the traditional hierarchies, yeah. because you're right. Like there's, there's something about that, that structure that's <clears throat> no longer fit for purpose that's with right. our, our current complex adaptive sort of universe. That's right. Totally. And, I, and I'm so curious about it. And people have been writing and talking about that for a while, but the time mm -hmm. hasn't been right. And I don't think people have been as receptive as they are now. And I think the generations coming up are uh, actively disrupting structures like that, and they should be. And it's not like it's an Eden, like there's, you know, you flatten an organization, there's some different kinds of problems, right? <laughs> but I do think in terms of relationship and safety, that hierarchy is fundamentally problematic and that it needs to be examined um, and, and, and disrupted. And so, you know, um, that's a long-term arc. It's not like overnight, but I do, but I'm, it, it's encouraging to see companies looking at it. You know, I just had a conversation with a, pers a prospective client yesterday, and I think that they were earnest in their interest in not le not um, in turning themselves into a coaching organization as opposed to a performance review, like hierarchical performance review. And so, you know, you see 
you see these places of sprouting potential. And so um, I sort of look to them to keep my composure and my optimism because I'm like, it's okay, you know, <laughs> there's lights in this massive dark empire. I'm just joking. <laughs> so what are you as we yeah. we're about the six weeks out from the symposium and then design competition experiment uh why'd you say yes i think you mentioned this at the, at the top here yeah why'd you say yes to this one and what are you what are you open to or what are you excited about what question is hanging in the balance that you think we can get some direction on from this. Yeah, that's cool. Well, first of all, I said yes, because you are involved <laughs> and I just, you are good stuff. And then uh, at least you're impressive. Like I, when I, we had not connected, but when I was looking at what you do, I was like, damn, like, how have we not already, you know, how had we not? Um, so there was just that, those personal interests. But also I had just completed the residency at Mural and I was so entrenched in these questions. And so it was like a beautiful opportunity to explore them in a meaningful way, in a research-based and disciplined way. And so that was super appealing. And, and you know, uh, the creativity, like the creative possibility is so thrilling. I love seeing people design new processes that have the, have that like make emergent you know, interesting emergent things possible. And then when you added the twist of applying it to a real world practical problem, it's like, how could I not participate? I'm interested in seeing what they do. I'm just purely interested in the creativity and the um, chemistry of the groups and how that, how that yeah. looks. Which is something that we talked about with, with Ronnie, right? Going back to the original study where they just pulled people impaired them for the purposes of the study. And that was one of the elements she thought might have an impact on creativity and collaboration is, mm -hmm. well, what if you know these people? What if you, yeah. <laughs> what if you have experience with them? Yeah. Um, how so is that going things. to affect the yeah. outcomes? So if I heard what you were saying, then you're, you're, you're a voyeur here. Like you, you just want to <laughs> You, yes. You want to see. Yeah. I, I feel there's part of me that it's the same way, right? Like, oh, yes. I just want to, I think it's fascinating when people just to see the agendas people might come totally. up with or how they might facilitate it totally. or um, how they're going to interact. And uh, how imaginative are they going to be? Right. Because right? it's a 90 minutes, right? So they have 90 minutes and they have to not only do the generative piece, but the evaluative piece. And like, that is, you know, they need a tight and they're online and hybrid and like all the stuff. So they have a, a tall order to a, to a certain extent. So uh, yeah, I'm absolutely, and I, I actually haven't figured out, do we get to watch them working or we just only see the output? I can't remember. Like, can I peek in? That's a great question. Um, I knew I it. It's an opportunity. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the invitation to teams everywhere is to register to run the experiment. And mm -hmm. uh, some of those experiments will be in the room. Some of them will be hybrid. Some of them will be online. Yeah. Uh, we're hoping, uh, we're asking, we're trying to mandate, but we'll see what tech says, um, that they all be recorded. Yeah. So we'll, all get to, we'll get to see them all yeah. to the fact. Okay. That said, one of our partners has the capacity to live stream. And I think it would be really amazing for some yeah. teams to step up and volunteer totally the live stream and then, you know, have advisors like notice what you notice, right? Absolutely. Like there's, there's an amazing um, inquiry and observational sort of educational opportunity in that. Huge. Yeah. And it would be a gift to new facilitators, meeting designers, you know, uh, game stormers in my language. And um, it would be brave and uh and really beautiful so uh so yeah i guess you're right dave i'm a, a bit of a voyeur because how often do you even get to see inside of the lab so to speak most of the time we just see the output mm -hmm. yeah well this this particular case is going to be an interesting form of bravery too because yeah um it's a, a 90 minute thing and we're after emergent magic and we're handing everybody a script mm -hmm. So if it goes off the rails in some way, 
it's entirely our fault. Mm. But yeah. be, you know, because that uh, entirely the the fault of the design and the process that mm-hmm. you know it's not yet sufficiently clear to be able to follow it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's a uh, another level of the test. Yeah. So, and just, um, I guess I'll, I can ask afterward, but I am curious about how, are we going to have people reflect on that prior to the, okay. I thought so. Cool. Yeah. Y'all think of everything. I mean, at least like seriously, homage because so many academics, so helpful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they come in handy, Dave. <laughs> right, the right. We have the right amount of academics. We have the right. <laughs> I know there is a chilling effect. There can be a chilling effect, right, on academic. I'm not an academic, and so, and I do crazy stuff, and um, and I like that about myself, frankly. I mean, I have discipline in my thinking, but I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm also rogue. I'll go rogue, you know, just to see what happens. That's the improvisational piece. Yeah, sometimes you need to do it for yourself as a facilitator. Indeed, right? you have to keep yourself entertained because people pick up when you're not engaged and Mm -hmm. sometimes you just got to do something Mm -hmm. out of left field. Mm -hmm. So son, Mm -hmm. I want you to imagine that we're a year in the future. Mm -hmm. We've scheduled another, well, maybe it's something in an analog world, right? We're having a a beer. In Utah, in the, under the stars. Um, Maybe we're having some Sham Pipple. Um, (laughs) And this experiment goes off amazingly well. Um, the best possible outcome times 5,500. What, what are we talking about? What in, in your mind has happened? One that's like communal and then one that's just selfish on my, on my part. The best possible outcome is that all of the teams who submit feel good about what they tried, what they did about each other, about um, their own capacity and their agency, like, I hope that they all, like, it's, you don't have to win the race. It's not about that. It's about showing up, participating, contributing, trying, throwing your flag out, like get in the arena. You know what I mean? So I feel, I hope they all feel good about themselves at the end, even if they, they not the, you know, biggest winner or whatever. Um, and that we get all these wonderful paths that ultimately can be offered to others. That is, a, that would be outstanding if it was like 100% great great uh, paths that they design. And then the selfish piece for me is I have a theory about uh, what I call generative social spaces. And I, it, it, for me, it's research around that ineffable thing we were talking about earlier, at least that uh, I, I don't think, I think my theory is pretty solid or my hypothesis, sorry, is pretty strong. And this for me is a really wonderful opportunity to actually see that unfold in real time with real people doing real stuff. So that's my selfish interest too. Selfish slash generous, because I'm going to write it all and then I'll share it. Like <laughs> it will still be an edification process for me and others. Yeah. Selfish is fine. You're right, it, Dave. It is. You're super it is. right. But There's healthy selfish. Let's be clear about that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's be clear. Uh, yeah. What's the most important job skill the next five years? Listening. Yeah. People are really bad at it. And um, it's the most, I think it's one of the most transformative and restorative and mobilizing and generative things one can do is just be present with people and listen. Um, And it's an ancient, ancient thing. I don't think it's something you have to learn. I think it's something you have to uncover think we already know how to do it we just get in the way so for me it's like softening that and then you're just available right so I think that's been powerful and I think it will continue to be and I think there was a term that Brene Brown used the other day I know she's like America's therapist or whatever but um it was story stewardship and and by that she meant people sharing something meaningful to them that you that you can steward so you're holding space essentially you're not judging shaming critiquing analyzing overthinking you're just being present and in that way you're generating um actually this is another can i have a nerd another nerd moment you're generating this term called the mui 
See that? Me plus we. Right? To me, that is what's up for humanity. <laughs> like We have to stop thinking we're isolated units that can be reduced to one person. We have to start thinking about each other as a part of a collective. We really have to de sort of deprogram from this hyper-individualistic point of view. So, and I think listening is one of the keys for that deep listening. And It'll balance the selfishness. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Like selfishness, I think we got that down. Not all of us, but as a culture, we're pretty good at that. Yeah. Um, so I think we need to understand the the connectedness, not the separation. And speaking of connectedness mm -hmm. and your Instagram account and the visuals that you were showing, mm -hmm. if people want to learn more about you, where can we send them? I think LinkedIn's probably solid. LinkedIn. Yeah. I'm not a big social media person, but uh, LinkedIn's good and um, um, Instagram's good. <laughs> yeah. And like when we start doing like our game storming day and when I start teaching collaboration, people are always going to be invited and I'll put it always on LinkedIn. So that's probably best. Sure. But yeah. Thanks for asking. You're welcome. Thanks. Yeah. For doing this. Yes sharing your wisdom, your experience. Yes, Thank you for being an advisor mm. on our amazing project. So exciting. We are better off for having you. <laughs> Thanks for listening. To learn about the new rules for work, purchase tickets, or submit your team for an experiment, check out newrulesforwork.com. If you're interested in partnering, reach out to us at info at newrulesforwork.com.